are the implications for, for example, for health? And to talk us through that, we now have a David Wardley, who has a fascinating history as well. But some of his slides talk about his history, so I'm not going to steal his thunder. I'll just hand over and let's say, well, David, thank you very much for sharing this. I have a bit of a challenge in this session. I've got a lot of slides to get through, and there's a guy here who's going to pull me off for eight to put after eight minutes. So if, if I do get terminated early, the one thing I want you to think about is in talking about the thinking about the impact of health technologies, look at the future of humanity. Is technology going to make us all the same? Is it going to make us all different? Or is it going to make us all the same but different? And I'm going to start by showing you three slides. I want you to spot the similarities or, or, and, and, and the differences. These are images of three actors. I don't know whether you recognize uh, this guy, um, or this guy, um, or these guys. Okay, each individual on this slide is the same but different. And I want you to think about why and how they are the same but different. Um, here's two human beings in the same situation, working with computer technology. They're the same, but they're different. But in what ways? When we look into the future, we have a vision of uh, what humanity might be like. We have a vision of what I might be like uh, in the future. Um, so when we're, we're looking at the impact of technology, how has technology made us uh, the same but different? Well, it's a fact, I think, in research, it shows that our brains are being rewired for task swapping capabilities. Uh, the, ch the changes in the physiological structure of our brains are developing more rapidly than ever been before. Technology is also taking over many cognitive and physical stack, uh, tasks that are done by human beings today, as we've already heard, and it's being used for mental, physical and mental capability. And in fact, the, the number of it is that technology is making our lives easier. So when you look at the technology, uh, effect of technology on health, it's helped us to do the following things. It's improved our lifespans, it's eradicated diseases, it's provided cures and treatments, aided our understanding of human physiology, and helped us to anticipate problems. And if you look at the top 10 causes of death, uh, from 1900 compared to 2010, you'll see that many of the causes of death in 1900 have virtually disappeared uh, as a result of uh, development. But today, our lifestyles are the most serious cause of death, they're the most serious uh, implications for disease and death. And you see headlines like this regularly. Uh, this is the head of the NHS, Simon Stevens. He's saying that obesity is like a slow motion car crash that could cripple the NHS. So we look at the global health uh, issues, uh, particularly obesity, and the consequences of modern lifestyle are very serious. They're facing increasing demands on our healthcare resources, and they actually threaten the sustainability of our healthcare care service for future generations. So things that we take for granted today when we have a problem with our body or our mind, and we expect it to be treated, those services will not or may not be available in the future. It's another example of um, public perception of an expectation of problems that are of our own making will be fixed by society. Um, and some of the, and the uh, suggestions uh, for the political solution, regular weight checks should be made uh, compulsory. So what are the causes of this situation today? Well, it generally blamed on sedentary lifestyle, convenience food, comfort eating, inadequate exercise, the couch retainer syndrome, and what I call the spectator society. So what do I mean by the spectator society? Well, spectator society is where we always come to expect <coughs> that other people are going to resolve these issues for us. And it's and then probably an extreme example of, of, of this is in this headline. This rather large lady saying that the benefit system in the UK made her 23 stone. Um, because the government is uh, at fault for giving her too much money in benefits that she spends on junk food, they should also pay for gastric band surgery and a lifestyle coach. <laughs> so if we look at who is to blame, who do we blame for all of this? The truth is that we're all collectively responsible for our lifestyle choices. Um, we all collectively uh, can find the solution. So what can be done? The thing is, we do have to do something because the consequences of failure to address these challenges are absolutely unthinkable. 
So how can we solve these problems? Uh, can we develop political solutions? Can we influence the food industry and citizens through public policy interventions? Or can we develop better uh, personal health management solutions and practices? Well, clinical solutions can be summarized by this. These are very attractive. It's nice to think that um, I can eat what I want and I know I'm not going to get diabetes because I can have an injection to prevent it. Uh, the governments have uh, developed various policies to try and influence our behavior through taxation uh, and education services. Uh, they give us more information about nutrition and the dangers of uh, things like smoking. Um, and today we have the technology available to be able to access our own personal health data in much richer ways. So which is the best solution? Who is going to provide it? Will it be medical professionals, politicians, or citizens? It's clear to me that we have to make this transition from cure to prevention. And the best chance that we have to increase our life standards and overall improving our health is to adjust our personal behaviours and to do so at the earliest possible age. Those are not my words, that's a, a quote. So if we use the analogy of the car, my body is not a temple, it is a car. And um, how is it a car? Well, you've got two cars that are the same. They're both cars, they're both able to take us from A to B, but they're very different. This is a, a Humber Snipe. Uh, my uncle was the first person in our street to get a car in the 1950s, um, and we used to have to do maintenance on it in order to get reliably from A to B. Uh, this was uh, my old car. They're obviously very different, but a car, uh, in, in the human context, uh, we all have a journey from cradle to grave. So we all take this journey, but we all go by different routes. Uh, and the vehicle that takes on this journey is our body. Um, and if you look at what ha what's happened with technology in cars, we used to use human skills to get the best on our vehicles, supported by knowledge professionals. Um, and the consequences of uh, that lack of, uh, of, of technology, um, or lack of developed technology in order to cause more breakdowns and reliance on knowledge professionals and mechanics to diagnose problems. But today we have the diagnostics and the artificial intelligence built into our cars to help us to get reliably from A to B. So my argument is that wearable and embedded technologies are rather like the transition in car technology. They totally change the dynamics of health management. Uh, so wearable and embedded lifestyle technologies provide us the tool to manage our health and in fact can act as a sat nav to allow us to get uh, from A to B. The problem is how do we change personal behaviours and who are the, going to be the, the, the uh, sources of those changes? Well, my approach that I apply to myself is this combination of gamification, the use of games, uh, mechanics and psychology to influence my own behaviour, uh, uh, used by enabling technologies such as the technologies I'm wearing on the wrist. So um, the, the results are demonstrable. That was me 16 years ago. Um, uh, and, and this was me. In three months I lost 21 kilos and today I have substantial improved mental and physical health. Um, and the way that has been done through uh, measurement and feedback technology that give me uh, snapshot data and real-time data. So we'll be looking at the roadmap for the lifestyle technologies. A wearable consumer device like iWatch are going to provide even more advanced health metrics. Um, I believe that in future, the cost of healthcare, what we pay, is going to be linked more to our lifestyle behaviours. It's going to cause a revolution in the healthcare system where, in which um, healthcare is provided by people who are not medically trained. The use of wearable lifestyle devices will extend into identity applications um, and this growth of embedded devices which, which will not only monitor our, our health and measure and give us feedback, they will also control our bodies. So uh, is the singularity um, a path to immortality? So there's three questions for society in my chapter in the book. Um, will these uh, technologies uh, lead to uh, a situation where society and citizens will rail against constant monitoring health parameters? What will the impact of business and commerce on these be if each citizen has a unique and verifiable personal identity? And what will be the impact on uh, society if embedded health monitoring technology becomes um, compulsory? So at the beginning I said, think about how in the future we are going to be all the same but different. Technology has had an impact on cars. I see one group uh, being that technology will have the same impact on the human body. Uh, 
Oh, dia punya ibu dia besar pula ya? No, no, no. So, thank you all for doing us. Thank you very much for listening. We'll have some uh, questions about that in a moment. But as well as thinking about devices which can monitor our physical health, and improve our physical health, we want to look at devices which can monitor our mental health, our intelligence, and we can improve these as well. So what we're going to hear from in a moment, after our speakers come back into the room, uh, uh, hopefully his brainwaves are telling him that he's going to be back here in a minute. We're going to hear from Dr. Andrew Vladimirov. I'll just say a couple of things about him. He is a uh, background as a hacker, in the sense of understanding security hacks and hacking Wi-Fi systems and so forth. But he also has a very strong uh, business interest and uh, sideline in uh, hacking the brain. Understanding what are the electrical signals in and outside the brain and outside the brain and how they might be linked up in the way that devices get linked up to networks or possibly people's brains might be linked up in a kind of neural social network. You've got two minutes left, Andrew. <laughs> so Andrew is actually being filmed by two sets of uh, cameras at once, which is uh, why it is a slight delay. Anybody have a question just now for David Wortley? Anybody got views on whether all this monitoring will be too intrusive? <coughs> Was it just what? Yes, question over here. Say again? I look forward to seeing the wearables. You look forward to seeing the wearables? Yes. So which wearables are you using, David? Well, I, I have three on me at the moment. Um, I have the Jawbone up, the Withings Pulse, and a, a new one from Korea, uh, which points to the direction of future health because it includes not only uh, measuring your steps and your calories burned and your, your, your sleep patterns, but it also measures things like heart rate variability and stress levels. So if you want to study his wearables in more detail, that yes, will be possible in the park later on. Show you. <laughs> yes. And let's give a warm, warm welcome to Andrew Vladimir. Well, I have to say my slides are going to be very boring, but there is a disclaimer at the end explaining why uh, there are no fancy pictures and colors. So just to start, here are some key terms uh, I'm going to use. And I have to say that any data derived from the brain, whether it's EEG or whether it's any other measurement, I would simply refer to as the brain data for the purpose of this presentation. Now, the neurosocial network, I believe, was the term uh, that has been coined at the anticipating uh, 2025 conference uh, back in March uh, last year, and it was first mentioned in uh, my chapter in anticipating 2025 book. And here it is referred to as a network that relies upon direct B2B, not business-to-business, to business, brain to brain communications between multiple users, share selected sets of brain data, not everything, just the selected one, and it is a step towards what we might call a digital noosphere. Not the invented noosphere by uh, Vernadsky or the Art of but the actual thing that exists in that works. So, not a philosophical concept. Now, neurosocial rewrite is referring to scenarios where such forms also involve controlled neurostimulation, so we don't just read data from the selected brain area, but we also write to it directly by applying a stimulating signal. Of course, providing any information uh, to the brain uh, would constitute writing to it, but here it's explicitly referred to neurostimulation, not by, uh, not by providing visual uh, or uh, any other common uh, sensory input. So, talking about the components, what is it made of? Now, brain-computer interfaces are the ultimate wearables, and on that I'm picking up from the previous speaker. And so are neurostimulation devices, and here I'm referring to non-invasive and safe devices, so we're talking about big signal stimulation, which is modulatory in nature. I personally believe, at least when it comes to end-user devices, and not devices used in controlled conditions in hospitals, labs, and so forth, 
uh, we should not cross that threshold which makes neurons fire. We can only uh, try to influence probability of neuronal firing, not to force them to fire. And in such a way, we can avoid many potential side effects. But the penultimate variable would be, of course, BCI and neurostimulator combined together. So the stimulation effects can be measured and controlled in real time, hence creating a full feedback. Then, inevitably, all virtual reality devices and peripheral variables the previous speaker was talking about will be added to the concoction. And if someone is familiar with peer feedback, I guess there will be quite a lot of people who are so. Uh, you know what I'm speaking about. Temperature sensors, heart rate variability, etc., uh, etc. Et Finally, we have the media. And the media, in this case, would be any social network plugin. So it could be integrated within Facebook, Google, Twitter, you name it. And the communication protocols, file formats uh, involved. So, the current state of affairs. Our PCIs are uh, incredibly uh, popular those days as compared to the past. Uh, I'm using mind, I'm using views at the moment. Uh, this is a newer BCI. Uh, Mindwave, you have probably uh, seen it and used it before. Uh, then you have TSKs, which are nice tiny sensors, very hackish, you can place them anywhere. They actually have a uh, very good sampling rate and uh, uh, very good resolution for such a small and cheap device. The motive insight is coming soon and so on. Then you have the actual and user neurostimulators. Now Focus, which is nearly charged here, is probably the first commercial neurostimulator out there you can buy, which is marketed for enhancing gaming performance. Then you have Think, which is already out in the States. Sales will become in October. Uh, then we have various DIY uh, DDCS kits. And then, for instance, I'm using the device at the moment which is not intended for neurostimulation, but it works. In this case, it's transcranial laser stimulation, together with the measurement. And as I put from the previous pre presentation, the current state of sensors data gathering, not to mention any neurostimulation devices, still resembles pre-internet or even pre one computing. And even devices which come from the same vendor, they're not really internet. I mean, those small TSK sensors, I can connect four sensors to a controller, which is in the box next to it, but uh, that's sort of pre one yeah, You can swap them on four different people to get the data simultaneously from one position, but that's not incredibly exciting. And the whole point here is if something can be networked, and I don't mean just personal area network alone, it will be. So if there is an internet of thing, there would be an internet of brains, and its birth is inevitable. Also, it would also include data from peripheral networks. Now, technical developments. Uh, since we have that, since we don't have that much time, I've probably skipped through it, and uh, we can discuss them later on. But there are many interesting things that would appear in approximately 10 years, which are listed on that slide. Now, as we are talking about business use cases, we'll all start from gaming and entertainment, uh, joining together with virtual reality devices. It would be used in neuromarketing, uh, where we have to be careful that it's read only. There will be corporate use, including for brainstorming, training, coaching, peak performance, enhancement, performance control. Uh, military, of course, would be an early adopter. They are already using, for instance, the DCS kit in drone, in drone uh, operators and sniper training. <coughs> inevitable that military is going to be involved. Education, very good thing, performance control, big performance. At the same time, we can influence uh, mental learning, we can influence motor learning, so team sports, performance control, again, big performance enhancement, collective self-improvement, including any kind of training, uh, cognition enhancement exercises, and meditation practices. Then we can have semi-medical use, collective psychotherapy, counseling, and ironically, medical use where it would be the most useful and one can actually easily envision a scenario where you have a neurologist monitoring, let's say, the epilepsy patients in real time, and then uh, the sensor actually shows that the feed is coming and the neurologist presses a button and the stimulation signal prevents the feed. So that would even be done automatically. But because of the regulation, I would expect that medical use, which is the most useful in terms of uh, actually helping people out, would probably be the last in terms of something like gaming and entertainment will be the first. Now it's quite interesting to look at the architectures involved. 
so there will be neurosocial networks where data collection only is used, for instance, in neuromarketing. Then we will have collection plus neurofeedback, then we will have collection plus neurofeedback and plus feedback control stimulation. Because it's all effectively a software as a service uh, model where the hardware endpoints uh, are just endpoints. You know, everything is SaaS now, so we have encryption as a service and so on. So I would expect we will have brain data as a service, we will have neurofeedback as a service, and finally we will have neurostimulation as a service. Just like with the cloud networks, we will have public decentralized peer to peer, perhaps using blockchain for anonymity. Uh, neurosocial networks we will have centralized ones, including plugins to existing social networks, which would mainly be used for gaming, entertainment, self-improvement, neuromarketing, open education initiatives. Of course, we will have private centralized networks, which would be military, as I've said, it's inevitable, corporate, medical, semi-medical, where we don't really want this data to leave the boundaries of that network. And then we can have hybrid neurosocial networks mainly used in education and research. Finally, specific risks. There are risks of adaptation, of course, and public acceptance is number one. But I have to remind that criteria of public acceptance to data exposure, they really change with time, and you've probably heard this old story about a uh, retired, very intelligent, but very old school intelligence officer who's been shown a few social networks by his son, and then he goes out and people to post that all for free. That's crazy. So that's how it changed over something like 20 years. And then we can have over-regulation, especially where stimulation is involved, where there are lots of food. Now, uh, risks of use. I would say the most existential risk is actually development of addiction, especially in gaming and entertainment, which is addictive in itself. Now, you improve the experience, you get people completely hooked up if they you know, if you develop an algorithm, a stimulation algorithm, a method which can reach uh, pleasure centers, uh, nuclear accumbents, uh, ventral to mental area, and so on, that's dangerous. That must be regulated. Then you don't want people to employ it in neuromarketing because you don't want people to uh, be more persuaded by neurostimulation. And then the bulk of the risks which remain, I would actually group them under the big uh, information security challenges uh, group. It would be unauthorized or unintended access, privilege escalation in regard to both brain data and system capabilities, including simulation. And I was thinking of actually doing a presentation at DEF CON on hacking BCI and hacking uh, neurostimulation devices, which are networked. You can potentially have brain malware which can be triggered by brain data patterns and triggering them. So finally, you can get infected by a computer virus. Uh, in the non-traditional sense. It can directly influence your mind. You can have side channel uh, brain uh, computer interface and stimulation attacks, and there is a presentation on YouTube uh, showing how to use BCI to extract a password from a user's mind, apparently with 40% success only, but it will improve. And then you can have assisted uh, neurosocial engineering attacks where a social engineer knows what your state is and hence she can manipulate you using the traditional social engineering approach to extract data out of you. And finally, this is the disclaimer which explains uh, how these slides were written and why they don't have any fancy pictures because I actually wanted to get some sleep. Uh, how much fun it was trying to edit his chapter. <laughs> no animals were enhanced in that process. So, so we have today the ultimate in P2P. It's B2B, brain to brain networks. We also heard about the forthcoming new SaaS services, N SaaS, neurostimulation as a service. That's what companies might be getting involved in, provided the various uh, regulatory issues can be understood and navigated. We also heard about how this stuff is a very real, very real in the sense of uh, transforming the healthiness of some of the speakers. So we have time for about five or so minutes of questions here before we into a general session. Michael, what's the plan? David. Yeah, um, 
Uh, David explained how uh, his wearables uh, helped him, but so I'd like Andrew to explain exactly how his wearable is helping him right now. Well, uh, right now, it's, first of all, it's a bit of a dirty hack. Uh, this device is not intended for neurostimulation, but at this power level, given enough time, uh, enough joules get through the skull from uh, 650 nanometer laser. Uh, so that's one part of it. Second part of the hack is that, for instance, let's say I wanted to use uh, Focus, which is an electrostimulation device. Uh, Richard Martin and uh, some of the other guys are working on uh, how to bypass this problem, but at the moment, once you turn on electrostimulation, your measurement device, uh, providing it's an AEG device, just jumps. So you can do it before, you can do it after, but you can't do it during, and you want to do it during. You want to actually see, actually see the real-time change and adjust. So in this case, uh, Muse is effectively doing EEG at uh, four points, and at the same time, because of this intensity laser light would not produce strong enough secondary electric field, it doesn't interfere with measurements at all. So, but this, uh, so th these wearables are making David healthier than it's been for a long time. Is that a pulsing in your skull? Is it making you smarter or keeping you awake at 340 in a way that other methods wouldn't? Well, it, it, it surely can improve your peak performance. And I've been monitoring, okay, that could be neurofeedback and most likely it is. It could be a placebo. Uh, it requires further studies, but yes, you can uh, see quite uh, dramatic changes in your brainwave patterns in a desired direction. Let's say uh, I want uh, uh, beta on the left frontal cortex to be higher than beta on the right frontal cortex for two reasons. One is actually performance improvement, I'm talking about low beta here, and the other one is reducing anxiety because when beta is higher here than here, you are anxious. So using it to bring it to the ratio you want helps to reduce anxiety. If you replace, if you replace um, beta with alpha in this case, which I'm also monitoring in real time now, then instead of anxiety goes depression. And there are lots of, lots of, lots of borderline disorders we all suffer from. And we can fix that using those devices. So it would be helpful for pretty much every modern urban dweller suffering from any kind of neurotic disorder, mild depression, anxiety, insomnia, uh, yes, headaches, addictions, uh, lots of things. So these are some big claims. I can imagine the FDA taking an interest in something. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a kind of law from before. Now, that's allowed in the States, actually. Yes. Because of the interest in legal law, you, uh, they do sell uh, FDA-approved electrostimulation devices. Uh, okay. In the states for anxiety, insomnia, depression. And the CIA approved them. Well, the CIA approved ones are those for the uh, performance enhancement of the community. Okay. Well, Alan, yeah. <coughs> The question is about um, kind of about self defence. So I only go around thinking that I'm I'm having my own thoughts, you know, and I'm in control of them. To what extent is any of this technology? Uh, how how far can it be remote? And how influential can it be, as far as you know? Remote in which sense? Well, could I, could I be in an environment where something is affecting my brain that I don't know about, that is, and has a big effect? Well, by doing constant measurement and pretty much knowing what uh, the measured data corresponds to, you can actually spot that kind of effects. So that would be helpful to mitigate it. And when you spot them, perhaps again you can apply stimulation to remove them. I mean, I'm only talking in very general terms. Should I be walking around with a tin, a tin hat on? <laughs> if I'm paranoid that, you know, some... some, well, some... Ages ago when they had... Uh, uh, old uh, style, not LCD, but the proper tube monitor. I used an app which was using this monitor to play the Imperial March from Star Wars and catch it with a radio scanner at 10 megahertz in the, in, in the next room. So I've covered the monitor with the tinfoil then, but I can still hear the Imperial March. So tinfoil perhaps won't 
<coughs> there is a, there is an application because I've, I've been involved in, in brain sensors as well for quite a number of years and uh, one of the companies I work with, uh, Neuroscore, they developed an application that uses uh, brain sen sensors to measure your brain waves and they're linked to Google Glass. Uh, so as you're walking along, uh, if there's something that really excites and interests you, it starts to video it, which could get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to actually open this up so all the speakers can uh, have their discussion points covered. But I'd like to say thank both uh, David and Andrew for...